So I am Trish McPherson. I am not Louise Romna. And I got a phone call last night during dinner. Yes, during dinner. And I was having a glass of wine with dinner. And Louise says, Trish, Trish, oh good, you're home. I said, yeah, I'm home. I'm having dinner. She goes, well, I'm in Massachusetts. I said, okay, because I knew she was supposed to give this talk this morning. And she goes, I was just looking at my calendar, and she goes, oh, bleep. I sa she said, I can't give that talk tomorrow. And she says, it's all done. The slides are all done. I have a text. And, and she was like, could you, could you? I said, sure, Louise, I'll do that for you. And the reason I said sure was because she's talking about the secret life of aquatic insects. And if I was giving this talk, I would call it the amazing, wonderful diversity of aquatic insects. Because to me, they don't have a secret life. What she, I think what she means by this is that most people know these insects in the adult stage when they're flying around. But my career was um, nine years with the power company doing aquatic ecology. We kind of helped, um, actually had a really large environmental staff way back then, 40 some years, 40 years ago. When they were siting power plants, they needed biologists to go out and see what was living in the stream or river where they might put a power plant to see what kind of environmental impact putting a power plant would be there, would do. And when I um, got married, I quit working for the power company. I then worked for the Division of Water Quality and was the biological assessment supervisor for that unit. So my staff went out and collected aquatic insects and fish and used that information to determine water quality in rivers and streams throughout all of North Carolina. So I've probably been in just about every stream in the state. And I've been retired for about well, not a little over nine years. So I'm hoping this comes back to me. And I pulled out some of my old identification books this morning, and I think I can do this talk. But we'll, we'll see. So um, we're going to start with um, aquatic insects. And as I said, these are the larval or nymph stage of most of the aquatic in, uh, aerial stage adults. So we've had terms, so taro is wing, integument is the skin or cuticle, metamorphosis, it's either a hemimetabolus or a holometabolus, and there's different names for the insect larvae, they're either called nymphs or they're called larvae depending on which state kind of metamorphosis they go through. And when you're working in this kind of field, you basically don't think of them as one or the other. You just, you know, I'm working with mayfly nymphs, I'm looking with caddisfly larvae, and I had to go back and think, oh yeah, they do have different kinds of metamorphosis. And a molt is just the shedding of the skin of the previous instar, and most instars have between five and six molts. Um, so we're going to start with mayflies, and I'm going to back up just a little bit that she didn't have in her talk, but there are probably, oh, 20 to 30 different orders of organisms that are found in rivers and streams. And when I was working, if you were in a high quality mountain stream, you could get 120 different kinds of aquatic organisms in a sample. And we would sample streamside. We would pick things live and then put them in jars of alcohol and bring the sample back to the lab to identify. So we had a semi-quantitative um, sampling methodology where we were trying to collect everything that was living in that stream, which meant there are certain things that might live in a riffle. And it's analogous to plants that you have in your garden. 
certain things are sun loving, certain things are shade loving, some things like uh, wet feet, some don't. And in streams, especially, which is where I worked mainly because you get a different fauna in um, lakes and ponds. But in streams where the water velocity is a little bit slower along the edge and you have roots hanging down, you get um, different organisms who like that slower water than you do in the riffles where they're um, organisms that there are certain things that will eat leaves and we would collect leaf packs and you would find certain things only in those leaf packs. Certain organisms are only found in the sand, so we did a sand sample. Certain things are attached to rocks and logs, so we would wash off rocks and logs. So to get 120 different organisms in a sample, that would be sampling all of the different habitats that you would find in a stream. And there are three orders of insects that she doesn't have them in the same order I would have put them in, but they're mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies. And when you're working, it's called EPT. So the scientific, the orders are Ephemeroptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera. And there are so many of these organisms that, um, for example, I have a whole book. It's just the stonefly nymphs of North America. And there's probably 500 genera of species. And then there's an entire book, The Larvae of the North American Caddisflies. And there's probably three or 400 of those. Uh, the same thing with <coughs> mayflies. And mayflies are, um, really fun organisms. They, they usually have the gills along the side of the body, typically three tails, some have two tails, but the gills will look different depending on the um, family the mayfly is in. There will be differences in the gills depending on whether they're in fast flowing water or slow flowing water. Some of the gills get to be almost like huge feather boas. They're just mm. so convoluted. And that's because they're living in low oxygen waters and they need as much gill area as they can get to get the oxygen out of the water. But, um, Chris, where are the gills on that illustration? These are gills right here. And so these are the veins coming out in the gills, and these are, the oxygen is taken up through the gill and into the vein and then goes into the body of the organism. So the EPT taxa are the most sensitive to um, pollution, therefore there is kind of a concentration on trying to identify to the lowest possible level, especially all the mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies. And we also had a uh, reduced sampling methodology that if we were, had a lot of streams to sample in a short time frame, we would only collect the EPT taxa because when you collect, and I'll have pictures later of the chironomids and the other miscellaneous diptera, the keys for those are not as good. They're a pain to key out. And um, a lot of times, because they're not as well known, the water quality information isn't there about, known about them. But mayflies are, are something that is really well known. And this is what you would see in the adult stage. Certain mayflies will all emerge at the same time, and they will swarm and the males will mate with the females in this mating swarm. And a lot of times, especially if you live near a lake, um, that's about the only place where the mayfly numbers are high enough, and it's usually the gen genus Hectogenia, that, and that's what these are right here, where they will swarm, and then, because they are attracted to lights, I've seen pictures, I've never actually seen it in North Carolina, but you could have bodies 
a foot deep mm. below a lamp where they would be attracted and they'd fly around and then end up um, dying. But mayfly adults only last a few days to maybe a week or more. But the mayfly larvae, which are in the water, will live between, they're the shortest lived of the EPT, three weeks to um, four or five months for mm -hmm. some mayfly species. And you can have several generations in one year. Um, so it's the difference between the may, the, the adults, all they want to do is mate, they come back, lay the eggs in the water, and then the um, nymph will be there for several months, weeks, weeks and months. And then another order of insects is the odonates or dragonflies, I think most people are familiar with adult dragonflies, um, but they, and, and also adult damselflies, and the difference you can tell is the damselflies keep their wings folded together over their back, whereas dragonflies always have the wings extended. And you tell, identify adult dragonflies by the ven venation right here. And this one is a libellula, because I don't know if you can see it, but this is called the dancer's toe right here. And that's distinctive for this family of dragonflies. So um, damselflies, I never learned how to identify them very well. I know the, wind, the ones with dark wings are almost all argia, but that's the most common damselfly in, in streams, and they're very distinctive as larvae. Um, these are dragonflies mating. Uh, just like mayflies, the adult dragonflies last for a short period of time, their goal in life is simply to mate. Um, the male uh, copulatory organ is at the end of his body, whereas the female's is closer to her um, thorax. So that's why you always see them in this um, contorted position when they're mating. But the uh, dragonfly nymph looks completely different. There are a lot of different sizes and shapes. This is a gomphid, and, and you, you know it's a gomphid because, well, a whole lot of different reasons, but mainly the antenna here and the shape of the um, spines on the side. But dragonflies are really cool because they breathe and have their gills in the anal cerci, those little spines at the back end of the body. Mm -hmm and they can move by squirting water out their rear end. And so they can be in one place, and then all of a sudden they're somewhere else. But I mean, they can crawl and, and move that way, but if they're in a lot of danger, they can shoot themselves to wherever they want to go. <laughs> but they come in, in different sizes and shapes. There is one um, dragonfly, it's called Genius, that it is almost completely round and flattened so that it is probably the width of five pieces of paper. Whereas these are thicker and, and so it's just, to me it was always amazing how different uh, the aquatic insect larvae can be. We do have true bugs. Most of the true bugs are, well, they are hemiptera. Uh, a lot of these are on the surface of the water. And um, they're about the only ones that can have adults that are aquatic, but they mainly stay on the surface of the water. Um, this stoneflies is the most sensitive order of the EPT group. Um, stoneflies, are, there aren't any that I know of in river and ponds or uh, lakes. They're almost restricted to flowing water. There is a lot of diversity. They are most sensitive to pollution. Um, 
again with stone flies the larval stage can last up to three to four years in the water and that was one reason that they make good indicators of water quality because if you are going out and taking a water sample you know what's in the stream or river at that one point in time but if you're looking at the biological community their lifespans can cover between the mayflies and some of the midges a few days to weeks to the stoneflies are been in that same water for years so if you go and sample a stream and you don't find the kinds of stoneflies or caddisflies that you would expect in that kind of stream then you can guesstimate that some kind of water quality event happened within either the last time you sampled or the lifespan of these larvae that are in the stream. So it's a very um, cost effective way of, of determining water quality by sampling the biological community and you can get a picture over time of what has happened. And, um, Stoneflies are also unusual in that there are probably as many winter stoneflies as there are summer stoneflies. So both, all the EPT taxa have um, families that are either more abundant in the winter or there are certain species that are present in the winter that might not be there in the summer and there are the same way some that will be there in the summer that aren't there in the winter so when I was sampling we would have to do seasonal corrections because usually in late April May you would have uh, winter organisms still there but the summer ones are hatching from their eggs that have been laid in water and they're present now in the stream so you could get an inflated number of organisms and, and predict water quality that is better than it really is. But the stoneflies, there are an awful lot of ones that are only there in winter, and that makes it really easier to um, sample streams, especially lower flow streams. In Wake County, especially out where I live, there are streams in, it's called the Triassic Basin, and they basically stop flowing in the summertime and in the fall. So if you want to learn about the water quality in those streams, you have to sample in the winter because the winter stoneflies will be there and you can get a difference between good water quality and poor water quality based on what you're finding in the stream at that time of year. And again, adults, the uh, stonefly adults live a little bit longer. They're four or five months at least. Mm -hmm. Are these all about the same size in real life? Um, I have a book here that it basically, it's really good. It, it's called the um, Guide to the Freshwater Invertebrates of North America. And they have pictures, but they give you a scale here on the side. So an adult, sto I mean a, a larval stonefly could be two inches. A Baited mayfly, which I, I, Chris jokingly said I have a, a bug, a mayfly named after me, and I like to call it the world's rarest mayfly because we've only found a few specimens of it. And it was a genus that was new to North America, and I was lucky enough to have it named Beethopus trishi. But it is maybe half the size of my fingernail, my little fingernail. It's Oh, less than half an inch, quarter inch long. So, and midges are even smaller than that. Some of the things that we collect look like giant threads. But once you learn what you're looking for, you know, it's, it's not that hard to find them. So the range in size, I'd say, would be between two inches and barely able to see them. And anybody else has questions, feel free to interrupt. So this is what the nymphs of stoneflies look like. Um, their gills 
here, well, here you can see um, the wing pads of the adults are starting to form. A lot of times stonefly gills are up here on their neck or they're under these three segments. Sometimes the gills are uh, at the back end of the organism. But there are all kinds of, of sizes and shapes and, and colors for um, stoneflies also. But they are the most sensitive of the ethiopiors. Um, Megalopterans are dobson flies. This is a picture of an adult. Um, this is an alder fly larvae, it's sciolus. It's fairly common along the edges of streams. They never get to be really abundant. Um, it's present, it's not a good indicator of either good or bad water quality. It's just another one of those bugs that are there. Uh, Helper mites are the dobson fly. This is the larvae. They can get up to about six inches long yes. and wow. they can hurt. <laughs> I mean, those, those claws, pinchers, the mandibles, it's been nine years, I've forgotten the terminology. The mandibles, um, they're predators, so they're going to be eating a lot of the other organisms in the stream. Um, these are their gills on the side of the body here, but um, they can hurt you when you're sampling them. And they can get to be probably the biggest thing that we'll find in the stream. A fish fly, this one's kind of neat. It's an adult, um, and it's just because of the, the wing, the antennae are so unusual. Uh, Caddis flies are my favorite. And the reason that they're my favorite is a whole lot of caddis flies make cases. And this is a, um, a leaf and stick case. But other ones make um, stone cases. Oh. And there are certain streams in North Carolina, especially in the mountains, if there is um, garnet in the rocks, you can get little pieces of garnet. And the cases are just beautiful. And I belong to a, a professional organization called the North American Benthological Society. And they have meetings every year. And one of the vendors who comes every year takes a caddis fly, and it's not this one. And, and every case is different based on the genus. So you can almost tell what genus you have without keying it out by looking at the shape of the case. Hmm. So there is one um, genus of Caddisfly called Ironoquia that makes a long cylindrical stone case. So the vendor will take an organism out of its own case. They put it in water with pieces of turquoise. They then take those pieces of turquoise. They build another case to live in. Then they take it out of that one to, <laughs> and yet they sell earrings. Wow. And it, they're beautiful. They're beautiful. They're like intricately because they use silk glands that are in a silk gland in the mouth of the larval insect that to hold that uh, case together. And I didn't buy turquoise ones. I was too cheapo. I bought some regular ones. Uh, and I've had mine for 20 years or more. So they hold up really well. But you can put turquoise, you can put garnets, you can put, so I saw one pair that was black and white stones, it's just, but these, they know how to make their case and if they get dislodged from, normally they don't make another case, they would live in this until they pupate, but um, there are all kinds of different uh, kinds of cases and um, well. So if you're in the stream where these are, you could find these cases going yes. around? Yes. Uh -huh. These would be crawling on the tops of the rocks. Uh -huh. There are other cases that would be attached on the bottom side. Um, some attach themselves to sticks or leaves. There are um, a group of uh, caddisflies that are only along the roots 
in a stream bank and uh, it'd be three different genera so if you were sampling a really really good quality stream you would find Trinodes, Ocetus, and the other one and there you could get sometimes three to four species of the genus all along the side of the stream and all their cases would be a little bit different. In fact, um, there was um, another paper that I have, which is just, I was thinking I had pictures of the cases, but I'll leave it up here. Just uh, the genera Trionodes in North America, and there's that one genus you can tell the, the species sometimes by the width of the spiral on the um, case or the type of leaves that are used. It, it's just very, very interesting and distinctive, which is why they're my favorite, because they're, every case is cool. Uh, there are also caddisflies that make nets. So this is the, the net kind of, and they attach it to a rock or a log and the water flows into the net and they will sit at the back of the net and then come out periodically and just eat everything that's gotten attached to the net. So they, the food comes to them and sometimes it brings in live things so they can be predaceous. Um, a lot of aquatic insects either eat algae or detritus. Uh, Mayflies especially just um, use their legs to um, scrape algae and, and a little bit of detritus off of rocks and out of the water. This is another um, case building uh, caddisfly. You can see the um, spiral uh, design here and the identification. This is a Brachycentris. Uh, you tell what species it is based on the pattern on the head. Sometimes it will be two black lines here. Sometimes this will be separated from that. So it's a lot of variation, a lot of diversity, and to me just some pretty amazing organisms that you find in rivers and streams. This is a caddisfly adult. They're very indistinct. Uh, they're kind of neat that they almost always have that striped antenna and really long antenna. I have seen tropical adults that are like bright orange and silver, um, but the adults, as in the mayflies and stoneflies, live only for a few weeks to a couple of months. And yeah, <coughs> beetles. There are an awful lot of beetles, just like there are terrestrial beetles. There are a lot of aquatic beetles. Um, beetles are very, very hard to identify. You have to look at the number of segments on this claw, and the, it just, it's just hard. I never liked beetles. So. <laughs> But they're pretty. I mean, they're all kinds of colors and shapes. This one is a pretty green one. And this is one that's a, um, a gyrenid. And it can actually get a air bubble under these hard wing pads. So it can <coughs> dive down and stay underwater for a while. Because this is an adult. <coughs> uh, but there are larvae that are, look very similar. And here is a Jared larvae that's eating a dragonfly limb. And this is the um, dragonfly. And the dragonfly also has a very distinctive, I don't know if I can't see it, but its jaw is, there's two mandibles, and then there's that long piece there, and it's a labium that extends like this. So they can shoot it out and grab hold of things, kind of like, a spear coming out and getting you. Uh, but he, in this case, he got, got it. 
and there are also beetles that live on the surface of the water and they have divided eyes. Most aquatic uh, insects have ocelli, which are not really eyes, they're compound sort of eyes. But this one does have eyes above the water and another set of eyes below the water so we can see what's going on down below. <laughs> and what's going to come down and try and get him from above. How confusing. Huh? How confusing. Yes. Can you imagine trying to look this way and that way at the same time? It would be hard. And then we have flies, which um, mostly in, in streams, those would be um, midges. Uh, there are a few. There, well, there aren't any true flies. Well, there are a few, but not many. Mainly, they're. Um, a biting midge is a stratagonid. This is the adult. This is um, uh, the larval stage. They're teeny, teeny, tiny. It's what you would call no seams. That's a common name for those. Um, deer fly larvae, which are um, the biting, the horse flies and deer flies that bite you. The uh, larvae can get to be a couple inches long. They're always kind of squishy and icky. And I had one co-worker who would always bet people. Says, I bet you 10 bucks you won't eat one of these. Oh, and then she would, she would up the price. Nobody ever ate one of those. <laughs> We're not that crazy. Uh, soldier, fly, dog, soldier flies and some of the other flies are um, more in really polluted low oxygen areas. Um, so I don't, I haven't worked a whole lot with um, soldier flies. This is a tabanid, uh, and the gills are at the end of the body. But the, um, the main thing that you can get in streams, and we could get sometimes 60 different kinds of chironomid. Uh This is labeled larvae and pupae, but these are all pupating larvae. I don't think there are any actual chironomid larvae in this picture. They're basically just like little C-shaped segmented organisms. But there is a large diversity in a stream. The families are certain families like the orthoclads are found predominantly in clean water. The chironomony are red and when you see them in the water they will be bright red and sometimes an inch long because they actually have hemoglobin in their body to help with low dissolved <coughs> oxygen areas so they're often in the most polluted areas. Um, black flies, if you've ever been up north and been out at dusk to dawn, black, black fly will attack you but the larvae are in the stream and they attached to stones in the fastest flowing water and they hold on to the sucker at the back end of the body and then they have um uh it's not gills it's um structure that is spread out to capture the the food that is coming through the water so it's like a filter yeah it is like a filter but it's um I was going to say it was their antenna, but it's not. It's a different structure that I've forgotten the name of. But they can be by the thousands on a rock. I mean, and you could have ten different species of black fly larvae in a stream, and they're also hard to identify. The Mosquito larvae um, are fairly rare in streams, but they're very common in uh, rivers and ponds. And the master gardeners get a lot of questions about. What do I do about my mosquito problem? Should I spray? Should I? And we recommend to not spray for the adults because within a few days, you're going to have the larvae hatching out of any stagnant water that you're going to have on your property. But as you can see, these mosquitoes and all mosquitoes have a breathing tube. So the, the larvae have to get to the surface of the water to breathe through that breathing tube. So if you put one of the mosquito dunks or if you put just one or two drops of vegetable oil, something 
to break up the surface tension so they cannot get that breathing tube out into the air that will really help with your mosquito problem. Trish, how about a drop of soap? Soap would work too, yes. Yep. And there are people I've talked to who like to put out a bucket of water as a bait for mosquitoes, but you have to remember to dump it every couple of days because it just takes three, four days to a week for the mosquito larvae to uh, pupate and then uh, emerge as adults. So that was the end of Louise's talk, and I have just a couple of things that I wanted to add once we get the lights back on. Um, there is, and I'll leave these up here, but I talk mainly about aquatic insects, but there are all kinds of other organisms in streams. There's leeches, there's snails, there are, um, we talked about beetles, a lot of worms. Um, this is a really cool, um, um, it's actually a fly, and this is the larvae and it has suckers on each one of its segments and it attaches to a rock in a really high flow mountain stream. And it's just kind of a cool thing. This is a, a color picture of a, a stone fly. And this is one of the larger stone flies, it's Acronuria. Very colorful patterns, they're just beautiful. Um, this was a caddis fly that makes a silk case, but it really is that bright green color. And it's called um, Ryacophila celadon, and they named it celadon because of the color of the body. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a cool thing. And this is, I don't know, you probably can't see it, but there is a mayfly that is my favorite and you probably can't see this, but it's got sharp spines on either side of its body and its gills are under this carapace. So it's kind of like a helmet over the body with spines on either side and there's a spine that sticks up in the middle and it can move extremely quickly in the water by just moving its gills very quickly. So with that, there are all kinds of fun things living in your streams. And if I had ended this, I would end it with a picture of a mountain stream because my job was protecting water quality. And this is a gardening lecture, so I want to try and tie in that if we use less chemicals, fertilizers, and pesticides in our gardens and in our yards, then there will be less going into our rivers and streams. And all these cool webs that I love will still be there and they won't be killed because the fauna changes completely when you get polluted water. So, question? Yeah? So, I, this may be a non-answerable question, but hmm. why, why is there any common knowledge or as, assumptions about why they breathe or have the larval stages in water and then spend their adult stage flying around well, or moving? Is, I mean, is that somehow evolutionarily important for them? I think that, yeah, like I said, through evolution there have been, there's less predation pressure in the water than there is in the air because these are flying insects and there are more things that are could eat them in the air than there would be in the water and also when you're in the water you can hide under rocks or under a log so that even if fish or bigger insects are looking for you there are more places to hide that's the only thing that i've heard is that predation pressure is less in the stream. Yes? Are there some insects that we could put into some of our more polluted 
streams and waterways and lakes that could help consume the algae and consume that, the, the bad stuff, try to clean them up? No. Uh, short answer is no. Uh, if you try and put organisms that are adapted for cleaner water, and usually that means the more pollution you get, typically it's the less oxygen that you're going to have in the water. And the other big pollution problem is sediment in streams, so organisms just get smothered. Mm -hmm. um, you, there aren't, there are ways to reduce the problems in streams, but it's mostly um, physically increasing the flow by creating riffles. So when you're doing stream restorations, instead of putting certain organisms in, they try and create better habitat in a stream. And that would be the best way. So you had a question back there. Yeah. Um, can you said the size of these organisms. You weren't including the antenna, and were you including the whole organism or just the body? Um, I'm including the antenna also. So the stonefly that I was showing um, somewhere <coughs> is, this is Akronuri, it's the most common stonefly that we have. Its antenna are probably only a half an inch long and the organism itself is two inches. So the helper mite is the biggest thing that you're gonna find in a stream and it's about this big. But most of the things, so like when we would go and sample, um, we had a sampling methodology where things were either rare, common, or abundant. One specimen, two to three, or 10 or more. So if you knew what you were sampling, you could stop at 10 and we would have a vial that was about this big and that big around, and we could get our whole sample into that size container, except for the big ones, which we would then put in um, empty Gatorade thing container, because it's easy to get. But yeah, so they're, they're, most of them are really, really small. I'd say quarter inch, half inch. I have one more question. I live in the university and they watershed up the top of the hill. Uh -huh. And my, I have an intermittent stream which we enjoy so much, but part of this year it was completely deep down dry. So what happens to these organisms? You said you have a similar stream. Yeah. What um, happens to them? That's a very good question. I have been to meetings where people have gone in and sampled the groundwater starting one meter from the stream, two meters, and then go out 10. And they found stonefly larvae, nymphs, a half a mile away from the stream. I mean, they have to have the stream to live, but they can travel through the groundwater when the stream dries up. And we have sampled Morgan Creek outside Chapel Hill, and when the really big, bad drought in 2007, it went dry and there was nothing that we could find. The next year, some things had come back, but within three years, we were getting the same water quality rating. So it went from poor back up to excellent because the organisms had come back. And a lot of that is they either went into the groundwater some of these organisms can go into a diapause stage where they basically go dormant for a while if their conditions are extremely bad. Um, so they are adapted to those kinds of conditions if that is a regular phenomenon in that stream. And those slate belt streams do tend to dry up in drought years. Yes? There's a lot of this stuff is in regard to streams. What about lakes, ponds, or backyard water features? Lakes and ponds, well, we only have two natural lakes in North Carolina, but reservoirs and ponds, you'll get very few, well, hardly any stoneflies. You'll get a different fauna. And I know that the better way for monitoring water quality in those kinds of water bodies 
is algae because they would, the algal community would change based on the water quality. But there are a lot of odinates, a lot of some caddisflies, some mayflies. So there is work that has been done on lakes and ponds, but typically in our reservoirs, once you reach a certain water depth, then the lake goes anaerobic. You don't have any oxygen. So there's only certain kinds of worms and midges that will be found down there. So it's just a little bit harder to differentiate water quality. But you can, you can easily tell about um, if there's been a chemical spill or something and everything is dead and that kind of stuff. If you were to do a backyard water feature wanting to attract dragonflies and whatnot, circulating are the things that They don't even, do. dragonflies don't need the circulating water. They'll come and show up and the beetles especially, um, we have uh, newts that, we have just a small, you know, water garden. Newts are in there, frogs are in there and I've seen three different kinds of beetles and midges and dragonflies. Marilyn. Okay, just to emphasize strongly your point about being careful about chemicals going into the environment. I want to discourage people from using soaps, detergents, or surfactants, uh, which can have the potential to get into the environment. Uh, you know, when Louise gave this talk at the vet school, the uh, whole emphasis was on talking to people who had water gardens and koi ponds, and also about the dangers of having uh, those type of chemicals getting into koi ponds because it will kill fish. And the same thing will be of streams, and you don't want surfactants and detergents and soaps getting into it. But if you have an isolated mm -hmm. water garden in your yard, then... Without any fish or... Yes. Yeah. It's a different story. So you were saying most of these insects only live two to three weeks? The adults, the larvae can live up to four years. Yeah, so a uh, mayfly adult, uh, five to seven days maybe. So, so if I see a dragonfly in my yard, it's not the same one coming. No, it's it, it, dragonflies can live a couple weeks, two or three weeks. So you know they're there, but three weeks later, it's different dragonflies. Yeah. What can you do to attract white dragonflies? Put a water feature in. Make just a simple. Yeah, because their life stage, the largest part of their life stage, is in a water body. So if there's no water body, they can't, they have to have water to be part of it. And there are ones that don't have to have a lot of flow. Uh, they can live in, in lower oxygen conditions. And then there are other species that do need faster flow and a little bit more oxygen. So it's been a little stream behind our house. And it always seems to have a little water in it. I don't know where it comes from, but right. and we have a lot. I mean, for yeah. just that little teeny tiny. Well, your water's coming from groundwater, probably, and it just takes a little bit of water to to produce a, a fauna that's there. Yeah, in California, we had a, a water feature, it was a little pond, and we used to have this, I used to think it was the same one. It was an orange dragonfly, and you used to come every day at the same time <laughs> <laughs> and sit on, on the, the rocks and the Every day was there, all yeah. summer long. So you had your own. But it was the only really, I don't think I saw maybe one other dragonfly, but that one, that orange one always came. Uh -huh. If you put in a pond like that, how deep does it have to be to keep, I mean, will they survive being frozen if it freezes all the way no, down, well, or do you need an 18 inch plus? They're, they're not going to survive being frozen into the water. Okay, so yeah. the pond has to be deep enough yeah. mm -hmm. to have some unfrozen right. water. Oh. Yeah, but our winters are getting, well, it's well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Yes? Do you put in a water fissure? Is there any lake that can be selected? Like, I would love dragonflies, but mosquitoes eat me a lot in my backyard. Is that really discouraged? Well, you, the mosquito dunks, 
affect only the mosquitoes because it's working on that surface tension. So the larvae, the dragonfly larvae don't need to get to the surface of the water to get oxygen. They can get it from the water itself. So you could have a water feature and put a mosquito dunk in there and have dragonflies. So, so the Bt bacteria, I mean that's what kills the, the mosquito larvae. Yeah. But, but you're saying that bacteria doesn't kill them or it's because of the... I think it's specific to um, those kind of larvae, the, um, the mosquito larvae. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, it's a yeah. bacteria. Yeah. yeah. I've always wondered that. Does it only kill mosquito larvae? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of soft body larvae. No, there's a lot of different species of BT that are very specific for hearing diseases. That's why really some of them are spread on plants, some are spread on other insects. It's very specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.